Um, it's my pleasure to be uh, the host today. I'm Roy Herbst. Today, we're very fortunate. We have uh, Dr. Daniel Petrolak, uh, who's a professor of medical uh, oncology and urology, uh, and um, the leader of our uh, GU program. Uh, he also, of course, is the leader of the signal transduction, one of the co-leaders of the signal transduction program for the care center. Dan's well known to most of us. Of course, he spent many years um, uh, at Columbia uh, uh, University before he was recruited here. Now, um, uh, seven plus years ago, almost eight. And uh, Dan has really, you know, uh, been uh, a leader in uh, urologic cancers, bladder and prostate cancer, just in the last year with some of his major studies, working with the PROTAC, with Craig Cruz and Arvinus, and the Infortinib Van Doten um, in bladder cancer, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, to name a few. He is a world leader uh, in this area. He's also built a, a team uh, in GU uh, oncology uh, that uh, uh, is uh, putting patients on protocol and, and raising the bar for these diseases uh, around uh, our, our care centers and around our uh, entire network and at the main center. So Dan, we're really excited. You know, one of the things we've been doing lately is having the different darts uh, present at Grand Rounds as a chance to sort of uh, integrate, you know, the more clinical translational program with the basic science. Um, and hopefully we'll have uh, plenty of time today for discussion. Uh, and um, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dan, and thank you for coming today. Thanks, Roy. It's, it's a pleasure being here today. And, and thank you for inviting me. You know, it's actually about nine years, it's gonna be September of 2012 that I came on board. And uh, it was the best decision I've ever made from a career standpoint. And I thank you and, and all the leadership of the Cancer Center for being supportive over the years. And a lot of the work we're going to present here today uh, was done by our group, uh, including Joe Kim, Mike Hurwitz. And, uh, but I'd like to give a first a little bit of an overview as to what is uh, going on in prostate cancer and, how do we think about it? So as we know, prostate cancer is really two different diseases. There's the disease that you die with and the, the prostate cancer that you die from. The Gleason 6 carcinoma, which is non, non really, uh, in some, some editorials uh, has been thought to not to be even a cancer. Uh, there was some thought about taking it away from that particular classification that was in the JCO a couple of years ago. That's, non, uh, that's really not going to cause a patient's demise. You have a 90% chance of being biochemically free uh, of relapse at five years, no matter what local therapy you go forth with. We're going to focus today on the castrate resistant disease. And it's important to think about this disease in terms of clinical states. As I mentioned before, there's a clinically localized prostate cancer, which uh, can be cured with local treatment despite local treatment, no matter what you receive, whether it's radiation therapy, hormonal therapy, about one in three men in unselected cases will have a rising PSA. This can result in a biochemical relapse or eventual clinical metastases, uh, which is the hormone sensitive state in the non-castrate disease as we see in the upper portion of this, this particular uh, slide. You also can have a rising PSA without metastatic disease. And this group of patients is somewhat problematic and, and when you institute hormone therapy, uh, because there's some men that may never need to go on androgen deprivation therapy. And this of course has significant side effects, including weight gain, loss of muscle mass, fatigue, uh, loss of sexual function. So this can have a significant impact on the patient's quality of life. And it's questionable whether implementation of hormone therapy at this state will improve survival. We then go on to the clinical metastases in the castrate state, and there are multiple treatments that we have available. And eventually we have pre-chemotherapy and post-chemotherapy patients. The, the, the landscape has changed. And I think the important thing to remember is, and this was uh, at Dr. Uh, Charles Huggins' uh, presentation of the Nobel Prize in, in uh, 1966, he was the person who discovered that prostate cancer is a hormone sensitive disease that if you give androgens, the disease will be stimulated, but this is not curative. Despite regressions of great magnitude, it is obvious that there are many failures of endocrine therapy to control the disease. And it's ironic that some of the greats of prostate cancer, including Dr. Huggins, actually died from metastatic disease themselves. So this is how we look at the disease in 2021. 
If you think back to 2004, when docetaxel was approved, it was pretty simple. Uh, you had one treatment, uh, and uh, this was useful for metastatic castration-resistant disease. And then you went on to second hormones or, or to, uh, to uh, palliative mitoxantrum. Now we have a, a variety of different treatments, immune therapy, which we'll be talking about with cipulucil T, as well as uh, other agents, uh, agents that affect uh, DNA repair, uh, other chemotherapeutic agents, as well as other hormonal agents uh, that show improvements in survival. But the key point is, is that we're not curing anybody with this particular approach. And the median survival is generally about uh, increments of, of anywhere between three and five months in this situation. So with this massive data, how do I like to think about this disease? Well, I like to think of this in terms of classes of agents. We have really four main classes that we use from a therapeutic standpoint for castration-resistant disease, namely immunotherapeutic agents such as cipulucil T, pembrolizumab for a small percentage of patients, which we'll be talking about in a few minutes, hormonal agents. Castrate-resistant disease retains its hormonal axis. And if you look at androgen receptor expression in specimens from patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer, you'll find that about 90% still have an active androgen receptor axis, and we're going to exploit that with some of these agents. In fact, it's known that some of the chemotherapeutic agents such as docetaxel may actually work by a hormonal mechanism. What do I mean by that? Well, when you bind testosterone to the androgen receptor, it has to translocate the nucleus, and microtubules are essential to the transport of that particular complex into the nucleus. I mentioned cytotoxic agents such as docetaxel and tabazitaxel. There are isotopes that damage DNA, radium-223. We're not gonna really get into those, but a uh, focus of, of investigation recently have been PARP inhibitors such as olaparib and rucaparib, and that's appropriate for about 10 to 20% of patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer. So we've been behind the lung uh, investigators, as well as the breast investigators, because for a long period of time, we've used clinical characteristics to determine how we sequence our agents. Symptomatic versus asymptomatic, the tendency was to give hormonal therapy to those patients who had, um, who were asymptomatic and save chemotherapy for later. That may not be the right way to sequence patients. Visceral versus non-visceral disease, and then pre and post docetaxel was initially used as a way of approving drugs for castration resistant prostate cancer. The other issue now, which is coming into play, as we've seen in breast cancer, and I'm not going to go into the specifics of this, but agents which have been used traditionally to treat castration resistant disease have been moved up into the hormone sensitive state. And there's actually a greater improvement in the hazard ratio when drugs such as. Hazard ratio is about 0.6, it's pretty significant. So, uh, so that state will affect what you're going to be doing in castration resistance because the resistance patterns may be different. And we're only gonna start seeing now how that may influence uh, the treatment of castration resistant disease because the downstream effect only started about three to four years ago. So as I mentioned, we've been behind uh, the, our colleagues in lung cancer and breast cancer in using targeted therapy and molecular markers. And the three I'm going to focus on today are the androgen receptor, those of DNA repair, and immune markers such as microcytal instability. So immune therapy uh, is an FDA approved uh, category for uh, the treatment of metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. And uh, the agent that's approved in the United States is something called cipulucil T. So this is an autologous T cell product uh, that's made by taking the patient's own uh, immune cells, culturing them with a fusion protein that uses both prostatic acid phosphatase as well as a, a GM CSF uh, fusion protein. Prostatic acid phosphatase is expressed in about 90% of prostate cancer cells. So this is very specific to prostate cancer. Uh, this uh, APC takes up this particular antigen. It's presented on the surface and you have a fully activated T cell by the time this is reinfused back to the patient three days later. So um, the IMPACT trial was published in 2010. 
And uh, this took patients who had had prior chemotherapy, all forms of, of treatment, uh, and randomized them to receive cipulosal T or a placebo. And it was shown that there was a significant improvement in overall survival uh, in the patients who received this particular product. It was about a hazard ratio of 0 0.775. Now, what was seen in this trial and what was not seen? As opposed to classic chemotherapy trials, you did not see an improvement in progression-free survival. And that led to a lot of skepticism initially because the PFS did not correlate with OS. Objective responses in soft tissue were infrequent. Uh, now, again, this is a select group of patients. So those patients who entered in the study had uh, bone-only disease or a minimal lymph node disease. They did not have visceral disease. You really couldn't see uh, whether there was a uh, uh, response, but generally the soft tissue disease did not respond. PSA responses were rare. We do see them. We do see predominantly PSA stabilization. But despite this, we do see a correlation between the PSA quartiles at study entry or uh, on this particular trial. So those with low PSAs have higher hazard ratios of survival or better hazard ratios than those with high PSAs. And uh, again, leading to the fact that we want to use immune therapy early in the course of disease. So for a number of years, we tried to explain why this happens. And uh, uh, Ravi Madan at the NCI has actually published a very, very elegant paper in The Oncologist in 2010, looking at the differences in terms of how we look at outcomes in, in, in immune therapy as well as uh, uh, cytotoxic therapy. So uh, on the uh, y-axis, we see uh, the tumor burden, x-axis, the time. And as we see here, uh, we expect the patient to be progressing rapidly. If you give cytotoxic therapy, you have a decline in your tumor volume or tumor burden, and then you see a takeoff once they become resistant. And often you see a parallel or an increased slope to what you've seen uh, when these patients were uh, prior to their chemotherapy. With immune therapy or vaccine therapy, what you tend to see is a blunting of that PSA curve. So what you're actually doing is potentially missing progression events uh, or uh, seeing progression events and missing an overall effect. So really the hazard ratio is what I think is important and the overall three-year survival. And unfortunately with the cipulosal T trials, uh, they did not follow patients past three years. And um, I've actually been after the company to look at that particular question uh, to see whether there is uh, a difference in five-year survivals. The question of molecular markers. Uh, we know that immune therapy with PDL1 in prostate cancer really doesn't have a great response rate, uh, generally about five to 10% at best uh, in terms of objective response in unselected patients. So this is a study that came out of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, looking at 1,033 patients who had uh, MSI high uh, in prostate cancer. It's only about a 3% uh, uh, hit rate with that particular marker. But what's interesting is that you can see this develop over time, that if you look at sequential specimens in patients with castrate-resistant prostate cancer, uh, you can see uh, upregulation or development of MSI. So this is something that you really do need to check regularly and uh, in, in our patients with castrate resistant disease. And um, uh, also uh, seven of those 32 MSI high patients had a germ line mutation in Lynch cyst, uh, cyst, cyst syndrome associated gene. Does this have an effect on response to checkpoint inhibition therapy? The answer is yes. Uh, this is their series looking at uh, both PDL1 as well as PD1 inhibitors in castrate resistant disease. And about half of patients will have objective soft tissue responses and a higher percentage of patients will have uh, PSA declines. So in my opinion, and I think the many thought leaders feel the same way, all patients with castrate resistant prostate cancer need to be checked for microsatellite instability. Pembrolizumab is an FDA approved drug in this uh, state of disease. And uh, this, it can be administered in those patients who have that particular marker. Uh, Rushanayan has looked at CDK12 in these patients, in castrate resistant patients as well. Uh, as we know, uh, biallelic mutations 
uh, are formed in a distinct class of prostate cancer. This leads to genomic instability, as well as the development of neoantigens. And a rule is also demonstrated with this particular marker uh, that you can see increased T cell infiltration uh, and um, also uh, responses in men with castrate resistant prostate cancer. So uh, we actually led a, a phase one study of a tezeluzumab in castrate resistant disease. This was published in clinical cancer research earlier this year. Joe Kim and I were, were co-authors on this patient, uh, this particular study. And we had two different cohorts, an initial uh, phase one cohort in the, of 10 patients and then a 15 patient expansion cohort. But as we can see here, the response rates with a tezeluzumab were somewhat disappointing, uh, about 50%. These are patients who had multiple prior chemotherapies or, immune or hormonal therapies, and we did see a fairly good median survival of 14.7 months, uh, but this is unselected. And there were two partial responses uh, by a resist criteria uh, overall. Now we tried to look for um, uh, molecular characterization uh, that may lead us to understand better why these patients responded. We saw some higher uh, levels of um, uh, CD8 uh, in, in these patients uh, uh, after treatment. Uh, we did not see any significant PDL1 expression, nor did we find microsatellite instability. And uh, this is one of our responders who was microsatellite stable, uh, had uh, really not a particularly high level two tumor mutation rates, uh, but he did have a mutation in ATM, uh, which you know, again, there have been others, some others who've correlated responses with uh, these DNA uh, repair enzymes, uh, but, uh, but uh, this was really too, number, too small to uh, make any conclusions. So where are we moving in immune therapy at Yale and what are some of the trials that are open right now? Uh, well, uh, we've been looking at a trial for, uh, with uh, BioXL, and this is in resistant patients, both who are castrate resistant as well as small cell carcinoma of the prostate, uh, looking at DPP-89 inhibition with DXL-701-201 uh, combined with nivolumab. And this trial is ongoing and accruing patients right now. Uh, Joe Kim in the phase one group is looking at a novel combination of a tezeluzumab uh, along with cabozantinib, uh, which is a uh, TKI, which, is, which actually was originally looked in prostate cancer a number of years ago, uh, but uh, uh, really a failed phase three studies. And as we saw before, tezeluzumab has an 8% response rate. Cabo has got a 5% response rate. You put the two of them together, they've got a 30% response rate. And Joe is, is working in the phase one group. He's also designing a phase one study to look at biological markers uh, 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 in a small select group of patients with this combination. We've completed a vaccine study uh, of a PSA uh, construct uh, with uh, uh, tremolumumab uh, the interesting thing about this trial, it was just presented yesterday at ASCO, is that we saw responses in patients who are hormone sensitive with a rising PSA, really didn't see any really significant activity in castrate resistant disease. Uh, but nonetheless, we did have a couple of responses. Uh, we're still looking at some of the biological correlates. And then <clears throat> finally, we completed accrual in a phase three trial of docetaxel uh, plus or minus pembrolizumab uh, on the international PI on that. And, Hopefully we'll see a positive result of that particular study. Now I mentioned before that uh, in the uh, castration resistant state, you still have an active androgen receptor. And there can be a different a number of ways in which we can see uh, this receptor, receptor become activated. In fact, uh, Jack Geller, uh, who uh, was actually in the lab till his mid nineties, believe it or not, uh, who was at UCSD, was one of the first people to describe the fact that if you took prostate cancer specimens and measured them for testosterone after these patients had un undergone either chemical or physical castration, uh, that you would find that there was increased levels of testosterone over time. So there's an intricate pathway of androgen synthesis. There are also alternative splicing mechanisms. There's aberrant function. There's mutations which will give you gain of function, which we'll, we'll talk about in a, few, in, in a few moments. But all these particular pathways can lead to deregulation of the androgen receptor, despite the fact that there are uh, serum levels of testosterone that are castrated. So one way that we can overcome this, of course, is shutting down testosterone synthesis completely. 
Testosterone is, is predominantly made with, from the testicles, but as I mentioned before, the prostate cancer cells can make their own testosterone as well as the adrenals. That is actually about 20% of all the testosterone that's secreted. So the adrenal cortex, the peripheral tissues, you can shut down uh, these particular pathways by 1720 uh, lyase inhibition with a drug called abiraterone. And this is the chemical structure of abiraterone. Uh, there's a second way of blocking the androgen receptor pathway, which is FDA approved, and that's using antiandrogens, which directly antagonize the receptors. Enzalutamide was rationally designed uh, from a series of different compounds that were selected for androgen receptor antagonism. The interesting thing about this drug, although over time it's been shown that we see very, very, uh, we see this occasionally, is that there's no known agonist activity. You see this occasionally with patients. There is a, some of these antiandrogens, when you stop them, the PSA actually goes down. And we, we still have not been able to correctly explain that particular effect. So you can decrease testosterone levels and block the receptors. Now, the fact is these, both of these drugs are FDA approved. They both improve survival again by about three to four months as we've seen before. Do we sequence them? Because these drugs in terms of toxicity seem to be less toxic than giving a taxane such as cabazitaxel or docetaxel. Unfortunately, there's cross resistance between these agents. PSA responses are generally 10 to 20% and you see a progression-free survival of about three to four months if you sequence Abby after Enza or Enza after Abby. And um, also we're finding too that taxanes uh, are less effective and vice versa. Uh, these drugs are also less effective act after taxanes and there may be some slight cross resistance. So uh, uh, Kim Chi at uh, University of uh, Vancouver has actually summarized this data and if we look across the board, uh, as I mentioned before, at best we see a survival of 8 points, about 12 months if you give these drugs sequentially um, and PSA decline rates of 20 to 30%, whereas the single agent drugs are about 50 to 60% overall. So how do we look at this in terms of res resistance? I mentioned before, you can have upregulation of, of different pathways uh, uh, and particularly CYP17. You could also see the splice variants. You can see induction of glucocorticoid expression that also may be related to enzalutamide resistance. So there again are multiple pathways that we can go forth with. One is ARV7. <clears throat> what ARV7 is, is a truncated version of the androgen receptor. The androgen receptor has three different components. One is the, uh, uh, the uh, DNA binding region. The other one is the ligand binding region. And then the other is the hinge region. So the ligand binding region uh, is deleted in ARV7. So this can, can be constitutively activated and then um, cause uh, activation of the androgen receptor pathway. It has to dimerize. Uh, so that's actually an important fact. As we see here from this particular slide, this is from my colleague, Emmanuel Antarakis at Johns Hopkins. If you look at those patients who are ARV7 negative uh, versus those who are ARV7 positive, uh, they have a better uh, progression-free survival uh, when you're treating these drugs at patients with abiraterone or enzalutamide. It, you also better PSA responses. So if you make ARV7, you're less likely to respond to these particular drugs. Now, taxanes are a little bit more responsive, but the, the response rate with taxanes are not as good. Uh, but again, you see a difference between the ARV7 positives and the negatives, but overall taxanes do have a better response in those who are positive. So this data was performed in patients with CTCs. Uh, so uh, uh, this is associated with primary resistance. The positive patients may still become uh, sensitive to taxanes. Uh, but in positive men, taxanes may be uh, more effic efficacious and um, there may be comparative efficacy uh, with targeted agents in the negative patients uh, compared to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, these next generation agents such as abiraterone and enzalutamide. So this leads us to a trial called CARD. And this is important clinical in implications to, to our patients uh, because what CARD did was it took patients who had received Abiraterone or enzalutamide 
for one year or less, then went on to receive docetaxel. And of course, the dilemma that physicians have in the situation is whether you treat with an alternative antiandrogen or to give a chemotherapy agent such as cabazitaxel. And this trial, I think, lends credence to the fact that these ARV7 mutants may actually persist for a period of time. Uh, because if you give a second androgen singling agent, so the opposite agent, if they've got Abby first, then they get enzalutamide. If they get enzalutamide, then they get abiraterone. Um, you have a better survival with cabazitaxel than with the secondary agent. And that's uh, in terms of both progression-free uh, as, as well as overall survival, uh, the hazard ratio is 0.64. So in sequence, we, we tend to use chemotherapy earlier in these patients. So what are we working on at Yale that may be uh, a uh, way of moving forward with this particular pathway? Well, a uh, number of years ago, Roy, uh, you know, one of the things I think has been neat about Yale, and I think the pandemic is really, um, has really hurt, is this seminar we used to have on Tuesday afternoons between the chemistry department and uh, the medical oncology department. And Roy was really instrumental in getting this going forward. forward. And uh, Craig Cruz came up to me uh, at one of these meetings and uh, said, uh, do you have a need for drugs and prostate cancer? And I said, absolutely. He said, would you wanna go forth with another hormonal agent? And I said, absolutely, there's, there's room for that because there's a mechanistic approach to it. And it turns out that the, the company that Craig previously had founded, the CEO had died from metastatic prostate cancer. So he was on a mission to find other agents. And this was really the perfect collaboration between a bench and bench bedside. So this is a novel drug. Uh, this is ARV110. And what's the science behind this? Well, we're trying to degrade the proteins. So there's a natural pathway, the proteasome pathway, which we, we basically can degrade proteins with a, within our body. So protax are ways of basically accelerating this ubiquitin-based uh, pathway. So you have a disease-causing protein. Uh, E3 ubiquitin ligase will bind to that. The protac will actually accelerate that. And then uh, this uh, induces ubiquination of the target protein. And uh, this, I think the neat thing about this drug is it's recycled. You can have as many as 400 uh, uh, androgen receptors, proteins that can be taken out by this protac uh, in, a, in a given uh, cell. Uh, and then uh, it basically is destroyed by the, uh, the protease cell. So why is this called a dumbbell? Well, this is the shape of it. Uh, there's a protein ligand domain, which is the warhead. It targets a specific protein. It's linked uh, to uh, the uh, lig ligase ligand, which recruits the E3 ubiquitin ligase. And so all three of these play a role in protein degradation. So how is this related to prostate cancer? Well, ARV110 is a protac that targets the androgen receptor. So as we mentioned before, you can have amplification, androgen receptor mutations. And this, this was this developed both in, uh, and, uh, in androgen, enzalutin resistant as well as sensitive cell lines. So there are a variety of different mutations that this protac will degrade. The T878, H75Y, the F877L, the MV895 point mutations, but not L2702 and ARV7. So does that mean that it's not going to work in these particular uh, uh, subtypes? The answer is no, because if you look at Dr. Antarax's paper carefully from the New England Journal of Medicine, you'll find that in addition to having uh, the ARV7, there's am usually amplification of, of and wild type androgen receptor which could be affected by uh, the, the different protax. So this may also affect amplification of the, the wild type receptor. As we see here, it's going to degrade 90% of the androgen receptor in vitro. So uh, two years ago, we opened up a phase one study that looked at ARV110 in men with castrate resistant prostate cancer. They had to have at least two prior therapies. Uh, we did not uh, basically eliminate those patients who had uh, extensive treatment, uh, we had required that they have either abiraterone or enzalutamide. Uh, it took us a little while to get to the, the 140 milligram dose, which is what was important in the laboratory to achieve uh, uh, activity. Uh, so this is the minimal efficacious dose. 
Uh, the, and again, as I mentioned before, on the day 15 AUC and CMAX, this was achieved at 140 milligrams or greater uh, orally. So here's some, uh, some evidence that we are hitting the target. Uh, this is a patient of ours that was treated uh, with ARV110, and we have both a baseline and a, a post-treatment biopsy that shows downregulation of the androgen receptor. Remember, these are heavily pretreated patients. This is our presentation from last year. Uh, we see that there is one patient out at 35 weeks of duration of treatment, and we did see responses. As a measure by a PSA decline, uh, we saw two patients with PSA declines of at least 50%, and lo and behold, these patients had degradable uh, uh, androgen receptor mutations, T87A and H75Y. And we see here that, uh, that the one patient with ARV7 did have a very minor PSA decline, but he also had a concomitant mutation. So our, our responding patient uh, here at Yale had uh, uh, multiple treatments, including docetaxel, abiraterone, radium, and enzalutamide. Uh, he had an A75Y and T7AA mutation, and I, he had a 74% PSA reduction after his treatment was administered. And his, at the time of the presentation, his uh, duration of response was 30 weeks. This is a patient from Nick Vogelzang at, uh, at, in Nevada. Uh, also with a very, uh, with the same mutation pattern, showing a PSA reduction of 97% and soft tissue responses. So where are we going uh, with this particular treatment? We still have two, we have a phase two trial with two open sub, uh, sub cohorts. Uh, those patients who harbor an ART78 or a 75 mutation, we're taking up to 20 patients, we're still accruing. And then those patients who received a prior second generation antiandrogens and no prior chemotherapy. Uh, the uh, subgroup one and subgroup fours are now close to accrual, uh, at least are on accrual hold at this particular point. So uh, we'll hopefully we'll open those in the near future. Now, I'd like to, in the last minutes of this talk, uh, talk about some of Joe Kim's work uh, in, uh, in, uh, with, uh, uh, with PARP inhibitors. Uh, as we know, DNA repair mutations are present in about 10% of patients with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Uh, these are predominantly BRCA1 and BRCA2s, uh, but we see a variety of other, age, uh, other mutations such as ATM, CHECK2, uh, uh, PALB2, and, and RAD51. As we know, PARP inhibitors work by the mechanism of synthetic lethality, uh, where uh, this is involved in single-stranded DNA repair, uh, whereas other agents are involved in double-stranded breaks and uh, the two of them combined together can cause synergy. So Olaparib has been evaluated in castration-resistant prostate cancer in a phase two trial. This was published in the New England Journal by uh, Johan de Bono's group, 49 patients. Uh, overall, the response rate was 32.7%. Uh, when they went back retrospectively and looked at genomic analysis, uh, they found that a third of patients had mutations in DNA repair uh, two thirds did not. 14 of those 16 patients with the DNA repair mutations responded, whereas only two patients who did not have that repair mutation responded. This led to the profound trial, which looked at Olaparib in two different cohorts of patients, uh, both those who are a BRCA1, BRCA2, uh, uh, or ATM positive, or other DNA repair mutations. And these patients were randomized to receive either Olaparib or physician's choice of therapy. Uh, the trial did meet its primary endpoint, which was radiographic progression-free survival. This was in the BRCA1, BRCA2, or ATM cohorts. There was about a four-month difference in radiographic progression-free survival. Uh, and when you look at all cohorts of DNA repair, there was about a uh, two-month difference, but the hazard ratio was 0.49. Now, this, I think, is one of the important slides from uh, this, uh, this paper. We see that those patients who have ATM mutations really don't have a particularly great response uh, to uh, PARP inhibitors. Uh, in fact, their uh, hazard ratio is one for death. Uh, and that's, that's really different than what we see with the BRCA1 and BRCA2s. And the PPR23RAs actually do worse with PARP inhibition. This is the survival uh, from uh, the trial. Uh, we see that there is a uh, improvement in overall survival, uh, hazard ratio of 0.64. And a big difference in response rate, 33% versus 2.3%. So 
So this drug is FDA approved. The second FDA dr approved drug is, is Lucaparib in a slightly different group of patients, whereas uh, patients in the profound trial were either refractory to chemotherapy or to next generation and androgens. This study was a phase two trial, not a phase three trial that led to accelerated approval in those patients who had uh, uh, DNA repair mutations who had re progressed after either uh, a, a apiraterone enzalutamide or apalutamide. As we see from this slide here, we predominantly have those patients who have BRCA1, BRCA2s, and not surprisingly, a similar response rate with Caparib in the BRCA1, BRCA2s, 44 percent, but again, the same pattern, uh, no uh, real difference in, uh, no uh, objective responses in those patients who have ATM mutations. And the same as far as biochemical responses are concerned, 51 percent BRCA1, BRCA2s had at least a 50 percent PSA decline, whereas none had declines in ATM. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit and uh, think about what we've been thinking about at Yale in terms of strategy as far as how we can potentially improve the, or at least expand the uh, use of uh, PARP inhibitors. Well, there are a variety of different agents that will synergize with PARP inhibitors in, uh, in vitro. These include BEC, MEK inhibitors, BET inhibitors, PI3 kinase inhibitors, androgen receptor pathway inhibitors, and we're planning a trial of of, uh, of ARV110 plus abiraterone, uh, but also anti-angiogenic agents. And Joe Kim is, and, and, uh, uh, has also looked at a trial of this uh, of olaparib combined with sidirinib in castrate-resistant disease. As we see here, it's an inducer of hypoxia. Sidirinib uh, treatment patient treated uh, cells do have uh, more hypoxia than the vehicle. And uh, we know that olaparib works in about 10 to 20 percent of all prostate cancer patients. And from data from uh, Dr. Bindra's laboratory uh, and preclinical data showing that angiogenesis uh, may be involved, uh, the combination of olaparib and sidirinib seem to be moving a, a logical one to go forth with. This was for a presentation at ASCO, uh, early ASCO G year, earlier in the year, looking at a randomized phase two trial comparing olaparib plus sidirinib to sidirinib alone these were non-selected patients. We wanted to look at this in a retrospective fashion. This is, was spearheaded by Joseph Kim. Overall, we enrolled 90 patients nationally, uh, 45 in the combination, each of the each, different arms of the study. Uh, these were patients with a median PSA of about 60. Uh, they could have had prior antiandrogens such as abiraterone, enzalutamide, and also prior chemotherapy. So these, again, are a heavily pretreated group of patients. So if we look at the uh, prevalence of DNA repair mutations, uh, overall 31% had some form of DNA repair mutations, either BRCA1 or BRCA2. Uh, the trial did meet its primary endpoint in unselected patients. Progression-free survival was better in the combination arm than it was in the uh, single agent arm. But we start looking at the data, we see some patterns which I think can lead us to where we can go forward with this particular approach. Um, we don't see really an improvement in progression-free survival in those patients who are HR proficient. Uh, we do see that in the deficient ones. Uh, it'd be interesting to see whether, uh, and it does seem to be somewhat better uh, than what we see uh, with the uh, PARP inhibitor alone. Uh, but there does seem to be in a very, very small number of patients uh, some response in those patients, uh, or at least improvement in PFS in those patients who are ATM positive. So this may be a lead for future investigation. Uh, as one would expect in such a small trial like this, you're not going to see a survival benefit, uh, but there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but again, that's something we need to look at in the, in the properly powered study. Um, so really to summarize, uh, we see a difference in um, uh, the combination therapy in terms of progression-free survival and um, exploratory analysis is seeing that, that in these particular subgroups, uh, there does seem to be an improvement in RPFS. So this is something I think that needs to be explored further in this disease. So I'll leave some time for questions. Uh, so in conclusion, all patients with castrate-resistant prostate cancer in terms of molecular markers need to be evaluated for DNA repair enzymes, uh, mutations, as well as microcytal instability. Uh, Proven should be used early in the course of castration-resistant disease. 
ARV110 has clinical activity in metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. And then uh, both Olaparib and Rucaparib are approved in these patients with castration resistant disease. And we're looking forward to going forth with novel combinations to expand the spectrum of patients who may be eligible to receive PARP inhibition. I'd like to thank all of our colleagues. I know I've missed people in this, but, but Joe Kim and Mike Hurwitz and Harry Deshpande, uh, who've really contributed greatly and uh, worked real hard in uh, moving these trials forward. Our research associates, particularly Shelby DiCarlio and Ebony Williams, who uh, helped to uh, see the patients manage the data and uh, really they're, they're invaluable to our operation. Matt Piscatelli left us about two weeks ago, but Kristen Fleischman has really done a great job in, in um, helping us out during this time period. I know I've missed a, a bunch of different people in this, uh, that, that have really helped us. And I apologize, uh, apologize to those who I've not included in the slide. So Roy, thank you for your attention and turn it over to questions. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, what a wonderful tour de force uh, in GU oncology. Um, I'll start, please put your questions into the chat, but yes, we, we used to call it the Cancer uh, Chemistry Colloquium, and we used to have that on Tuesday afternoons up on the hill. Uh, Scott Miller, the chair of chemistry at the time, and you know uh, we organized that. That's when Julie Boyer was here, and uh, I'm glad to hear that the ProTac work came out of that. Uh, so my question for you is, how can we do more of these here at Yale, Dan? Um, you have a great mechanism for clinical trials um, you know, that you, you've set up. Uh, you have a good patient population. What are the next uh, uh, next agents uh, coming through Yale Science? Do you think? Well, I mean, I think that uh, there's a, there's a next generation ProTac that um, looks more active potentially than ARV uh, than the ARV one one zero, and we're moving forth with that in the phase one trial. But I think that the the real next generation will be how to how to sequence these, how to combine these, um, using our tumor bank to understand. Uh, how to use these particular drugs. I think also, I didn't really get into this during the talk, but, but how can we use, how can we include other ethnic groups in our, our, our treatments? Um, it's actually an interesting phenomenon that uh, there have been publications looking at response rates in or survival to chemotherapy, immune therapy, and next generation hormone therapy in African-Americans. And it's actually better. And so we need to get the word out that these trials are open, that all should be included, and that um, we don't wanna see people miss their opportunities uh, to, uh, to get drugs that they can uh, move forward with. But I, I was really uh, surprised to see that this data, uh, we've, we've actually been involved with this since our original SWOC studies in 2004, when we saw a, a very, very big difference in, in favor of African Americans with docetaxel chemotherapy, uh, numbers were too low to, uh, to to make any real conclusions. But Susan Halabi has actually published on this with uh, combined databases, and this is something we really have to be uh, to move forward with in terms of understanding how our patients respond. Right, I can tell you in my interim role here in the CTO, it's been quite noticeable to me that we do need to have more diversity in our populations. And that means reaching out and building trust. And I know you've been doing some of that you know, with the cultural ambassadors and other groups and providing navigators. We have a question from Daryl Martin. Um, Rene, do you wanna unmute uh, Daryl so he can ask the question himself? Daryl? If not, I'll ask it. Well, actually I can ask it because you just raised your hand. Okay, um, any other questions for, for Dan? Dan, tell me a little bit about, um, about your, your DART and now with Isaac Kim coming as the new chair of urology. Um, any plans to uh, forge some new uh, collaborations, you know, build out the multimodality presence? Uh, I know it's still early and, and he's just been announced, but some thoughts? Well, I, Isaac and I have had a couple of conversations uh, already. Um, you know, he's, he's really been one of the champions in looking at um, local treatment in terms of patients who have metastatic disease. So uh, this actually has been known for quite some time. Uh, and in fact, one of the sister presentations at our original um, 
a meeting, a, a presentation of, of the tax tier data at ASCO, uh, demonstrated that those patients who had a radical prostatectomy uh, as part of their history did better with chemotherapy than those who did not. And this may be a selection factor, but this has been observed by numerous investigators. So Isaac is actually looking at a uh, protocol, he's bringing this, this with him, to evaluate local treatment in terms of metastatic disease. Uh, should these patients receive a radical prostatectomy? Often my patients will ask me that question. Should they get local radiation treatment? Well, it's actually part of some of our treatment regimens already to begin with. So he's going to bring a unique look at this particular area and we're going to be collaborating on those trials as well as, as, well as some other trials that will be targeting uh, the androgen receptor. Excellent, uh, excellent. Yeah, he's already called me as uh, to, to move, start moving it through the CTO, so we've started. Okay, Yi Jung Kim had a question. Dan, at the time of castration resistance, either primary or secondary, do we, do we routinely sequence AR androgen receptor? Um, so I, I've been running, you know, routinely running this as, as part of a platform because we're looking to select these patients for the trial. As part of routine clinical practice, the answer is no. Um, I do not look at androgen receptor mutations or ARV7. And the reason why I don't look at it is that the, mm -hmm. um, we, there was a trial that actually Mike Hurwitz was RPI on this particular study a number of years ago of a drug called galiterone, which was supposed to be active in ARV7 positive patients. And the selection criteria were ARV7 positivity and minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic disease. And this, this is what killed the study because those patients who are ARV7 positive tend to be sicker and have more rapid progression uh, than those patients who are, who are not. So I'm not going to really waste time on an antiandrogen that I know doesn't work, such as abiraterone and enzalutamide. I'll go directly to chemotherapy. And we saw that from the CARD trial before. Um, so I think that, that sequencing should be done in terms of clinical trials, in terms of understanding the biology, but not right now in terms of routine clinical practice. Thanks, Dan. I see that Dr. Bothwell has his hand raised. Al, do you want to... Uh... Un unmute and we'll uh, have you ask your question. Renee will unmute you. I see you're still muted. Okay, uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, this has been really great. Um, Dan, tell us a little bit about you know the network. Um, are most of the trials open at, at, uh, at, at the different sites? So uh, we've been trying to focus on what's the best way, best way to balance things in terms of our portfolio. So we are, uh, the phase three type trials uh, are open or should be open at the, at the care centers. We did have the uh, Taxotere Pembro trial open. We do have a Pembro enzalutamide study open as well at some of the care centers. Uh, so we've been trying to expand those trials that are, 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 would normally be seen in practice. We're doing more of the phase one-ish type, type trials here. Uh, we, we actually have been putting patients on at Greenwich. Uh, one of our tax tier patients uh, had, on the uh, Merck study is, was on there as well. So, so we are looking to expand these trials out to all the different care centers. Great, okay. Well, um, we'll give Dr. Bothwell one more chance. If not, I think we'll, we'll end, but I just have one thought as we end, Dan. It has been nine years, I um, apologize, but you know, I've been here 10 years, and one of the first calls I got at Yale was from Joe Smilo, who's has, who our hospital bears his name, and he says, Roy, why do all my friends have to go to New York to go on clinical trials for prostate cancer? And I said, uh, we'll fix that. And Dan, you, you certainly have, and you've made us the destination for prostate, bladder, and other tumors, and uh, congratulations on your program. And I think many on the, uh, the call here today will now um, perhaps have opportunities to uh, collaborate with you and build uh, lab to clinic um, uh, studies. So thank you all for coming to Grand Rounds today. I'll just remind everyone that on June 25th um, in the morning, we have our annual ASCO review. It is virtual again this year. It's a little shorter, but we are gonna be reviewing many topics. Uh, Dan will be there hopefully as well. And actually for a very special uh, treat, we're going to have Vince DeVita uh, interviewed by his daughter, 
talking about the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act. So that's going to be very special. So I hope to see everyone there and uh, have a good day, everyone.